let's start and uh, i hope the recording has started okay so this session uh, fourth session of uh, the program we have uh, three uh, talks 20 minute um, each so 15 plus uh, 5 um, so before we begin i will request all the speakers to stick to the time so that we have enough uh, time for the question and answer at the end of the talk of course we also have the discussion session at the end of uh, these three talks so the next speaker is uh, Saurabh Paul um, who will be telling us about the H1 intensity mapping with the Meerkat interferometer um, Saurabh is at uh, University of Western Cape so Saurabh you can uh, start sharing your um, screen uh, okay so is my screen uh, visible Yes, yes, it's visible. And so you have uh, uh, 15 minutes for your talk. I will give you uh, one thing around 12, 13 minutes. All right, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Saurav and I'm going to talk about our ongoing work on the H1 intensity mapping with uh, the Miyakad interferometer. And uh, this work is done uh, with uh, Mario Santos and uh, Junet, who is currently a PhD student working with uh, me and Mario. Um, so just to give a brief idea of what uh, intensity mapping technique is, I mean, it has been talked about a few times in this uh, workshop. So uh, the much of the observational cosmology uh, in current days uh, is dedicated to study the matter distribution of the universe because the matter distribution is the key uh, to understand uh, various cosmological quantities like uh, uh, age, geometry, uh, of the, and, and, and the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, nature at uh, 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 nature of the dark matter uh, in the initial condition of the universe so on and so forth uh, but unfortunately this uh, matter distribution is uh, not directly visible to us and uh, we uh, we need tracers such as galaxies to uh, understand or to uh, uh, detect the matter distribution but finding or detecting the uh, each individual galaxy with uh, uh, great precision with its spectroscopy density is very costly uh, that's why people have come out uh, with uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with another approach, which is called the intensity mapping technique. Uh, the idea here is to uh, make a, a map of the sky with uh, very large pixels. So uh, the goal here is not to detect individual galaxies, rather uh, a collective emission from H1 emissions from all the all the galaxies that fall within that pixels and that can boost up the signal. So, uh, so the, in the, in this schematic, you can see that uh, the uh, there is a galaxy map, and each galaxy can host some H1 mass. And if we can uh, make an intensity map, it will look something like this. So it it's really a pixelated uh, a diffuse H1 emission that uh, we are uh, that we are uh, after, because this can uh, this H1 emission can uh, actually give us an idea of the underlying matter distribution. Uh, we are not, uh, uh, I mean, this is okay for uh, the cosmological purpose, but I mean, uh, for imaging, of course, this is not as good as other uh, uh, the interferometric imaging. And, uh, 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 and one of the major advantage of this approach is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the observed frequency and the redshift, and therefore we can get a very high redshift resolution in this uh, method. So uh, there are two kind of uh, intensity mapping uh, uh, approach people generally uh, take. Uh, so there is one is a single dish intensity mapping and there is interferometric intensity mapping. So in the single dish uh, mode, what is done is that uh, the idea here is to uh, like uh, survey a large area of the sky. And uh, so this large area of the large scales can give us access to very small K modes. But on the higher uh, K uh, region, this is, it is restricted by its uh, primary beam size. So, uh, so that's where then interferometer comes. So, in the interferometric mode, we can uh, we can study a specific region or the well-known uh, region of the sky, and uh, we can uh, get access to those scales which are not otherwise uh, 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 possible in the single dish mode. So, uh, so you can see in these plots on the right, uh, these are the scales which are accessible to single dish mode, and these are the scales which is accessible to the interferometric mode. So, the quasi-linear to small scales. So, um, uh, so I work on this interferometric mode and the kind of the work, uh, uh, the, uh, the statistical detection of uh, uh, this H1 signal uh, with this interferometric uh, intensity mapping uh, technique. So, in in one way, this interferometric intensity mapping uh, uh, works uh, acts as a complementary to the single dish uh, uh, single dish uh, intensity mapping. 
So how this uh, uh, radio re interferometric uh, statistical detection works. So uh, uh, this is, uh, this may be known to many of you. So I'll just uh, still cover this uh, slide. Uh, so uh, it turns out that the, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the radio interferometric space and the Fourier space, uh, uh, cosmological Fourier space, where we want to uh, detect the H1 power spectrum. So, uh, so we, the, in, on, the, on the left, you see this UV and tau uh, domain. And the, on the right, you see the KX, KY, K parallel domain in the cosmological space. So, so there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the U to KX, V to KY, and tau to K parallel. So, and the tau is the Fourier of the frequency in this in the delay space, and kx and ky is on the plane of the sky, and k parallel is along the line of sight. So, for each visibility measurement in this UV tau space, we can construct a power spectrum, value of the power spectrum, and which is ju just squaring of the visibility and with some other normalization constant. The full equation is written in this, in this box. And on, the, on this box, so the, the transformation equation between this kx, uh, k uh, domain and the, and the uv tau domain is uh, given. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a major advantage here because, it, I mean, if we have a well-calibrated data, we don't need to make any images. We, we can directly construct the power spectrum from the observed visibility. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, how we uh, want to uh, uh, have a, uh, that's how we want to make a pipeline. So, so this is a basic uh, like the schematic of the interferometric industry mapping pipeline. So the idea here is to uh, detect a uh, large volume of the sky uh, with, a, with, a, with an interferometric array, and uh, which is as at a, at a co-moving distance r given by the frequency observation and the co-moving width delta r, which is given by the bandwidth. And uh, from the uh, observed visibilities, we can construct a 3D cylindrical volume in the kx, ky, k parallel space. And from here, we can either collapse the kx and ky to make a single k perpendicular axis. And uh, we can show the power spectrum as a, a 2D plot is a k, per, a k parallel, k perpendicular, or we can uh, collapse the all three kx, ky, and k parallel to make a single k uh, vector. And since uh, there is no spe uh, specific direction uh, on, on the space in the universe, we can, we can uh, actually, uh, we can, this, this type of uh, combining the axis is allowed. So uh, that's the basic schematic, like how an interferometric uh, IM, uh, intensity mapping uh, works. So and so the next slide uh, it shows like why Meerkat. I mean, why Meerkat is a good instrument to do such things. So just a basic uh, in, uh, introduction. Meerkat is a precursor to the SK. Uh, it it is uh, located in the Karoo region, South Africa, and uh, the array has 64 uh, dish antennas of 13.5 meter diameter. And uh, the, one of the major advantages is that the central core region, because the central core region of one, one kilometer has around 48 antennas, and it is, gives us lots and lots of short baselines. And these short baselines translate to very high sensitivity at low uh, k perpendicular modes, and that's where we want to uh, where we want to detect the uh, uh, zone. And it currently operates in the L-band range, uh, so it, we can get access to redshift 0.66 also. So, uh, so the next thing that we wanted to try is that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the first step of this project is to uh, uh, measure the sensitivity or the uh, estimate the what kind of constraint we can achieve with the current configuration. So the, for that, we have uh, uh, made a power spectrum pipeline. And here, uh, so the goal here is two. So first we want to, of course, uh, check the sensitivity. And the second is like, if we have an H1 signal as an input, can we get it back at the end of the pipeline uh, well, and what kind of constraint we get? For that, we have selected an actual data, like we have selected the data to extract the UV distribution. So the data is from the MITE survey. So MITE is a large scale area sky survey uh, under the Meerkat, uh, for the, with the Meerkat telescope. So, and we have selected some 11.2 hours of data from the cosmos field. And, we have, and on the right, you see the <coughs> baseline distribution. So we have simulated visibilities per baseline. So each, vis each visibility, each baseline uh, visibilities has three components, the H1 thermal noise and the foreground. We have simulated the H1 and thermal noise component per baseline <coughs> and they, from an H1 model. And <coughs> uh, from the uh, system temperature and effective radio information, we have generated the thermal noise as a Gaussian uh, random process with zero mean and uh, the sigma given by this. And for the foreground, we have actually uh, made an image of this from this data. And we have used this sky model, the resulting sky model, as a as a foreground component uh, in the in the visibility. Uh, so that's our um, that's that's how we are, we make a simulated visibility set. 
And in this slide, uh, 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 I show I'm showing uh, the, uh, the the 2D power spectrum for three different components because in our power, in, in our in our power spectrum pipeline we can select like which component can go through uh, in, in 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 the visibility so we can switch off, turn off and on and off uh, individual components. So uh, so these are the results from a single realization. The first one is a 2D power spectrum for the H1 signal in the k parallel k uh, uh, k perpendicular k parallel domain. And for the H1 signal, you can see it has a it has an isotropic nature, and these lines, uh, the da dashed lines, are uh, uh, lines for constant k, and uh, it has uh, as a, uh, just by looking at the uh, color scales for the, uh, different uh, cases, you can see that how weak this H1 signal is compared to the thermal noise and the foreground. Uh, so, and the next, uh, the second, the middle one shows the uh, case where we have included only H1 and thermal noise. And uh, just thermal noise just totally suppresses the H1. And uh, the, the, the thing to notice here is that we have very high sensitivity at low K perpendicular because we have very many short baselines. So in this plot, again, I am showing the baseline distribution and the right plot is the number of uh, uh, UV points after we have greeted the UV plane. So we have many uh, baselines at the, at the small K, uh, K perpendicular range. So the, the bottom <coughs> x-axis is the UV distance and the uh, upper x-axis is the k perpendicular, corresponding k perpendicular values. And since we have many, uh, short, many short baselines, we have very high sensitivity. And on the third uh, uh, figure, we have the all three components present in the simulation, the H1 thermal noise and the foreground. And since foreground has a uh, smooth spectral nature compared to uh, H1, uh, so it, uh, it kind of isolates in, in this wedge-shaped region. So the idea here is to not to subtract the foreground, so rather isolate the foregrounds and uh, try a detection in this uh, with, with the, this relatively foreground free region where it is mostly dominated by H1 and thermal noise. So the next thing uh, uh, I'm going to show is that how our simulation uh, compares with the actual uh, uh, data. So as we have already the data for the 11.2 hours from the cosmos field, we make a comparison between the simulation and the real data set. So on the left side, we have again a single relation of the simulation and the right, we have the power spectrum from the actual data. So in terms of the foreground isolation uh, and in the, the wedge boundary and the thermal noise feature at the higher K parallel, there is a great match, but there are some foreground, uh, there are some systematics or leakages pre present in this uh, at the, the, the uh, small K parallel, uh, which, which, uh, which are probably systematics because we are currently doing autocorrelation. So we also have the systematics are not washed away or, and we also have the noise bias. Uh, in this, in, 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 the, in the actual data. So as you'll see in the uh, following slides, uh, by doing a cross correlation between two between different data sets, some of the systematics can uh, go away. So, uh, so that, uh, that's, uh, that's a good thing that we have a good match between the simulation and the, uh, the, and the power spectrum from the real data. And the plot on the right shows the expected constraints that we can achieve uh, with the MITE survey. For this, we have uh, made a thousand realization of the simulation. And since we have, a, we have the thermal noise model, we have subtracted the thermal noise flow to subtract the thermal uh, noise bias. And these are the kind of constants we can achieve with different hours of integration. So 22 hours, 55, 110 hours. So these are uh, just obtained by multiplying the, uh, our available data. The, uh, so like we have the 11.2 hours of data approximately. So it's like two times, five times and 10 times of that. So this gives us, uh, this shows that we can actually uh, make a detection with uh, around less than 100, 100 hours of observation uh, of, the, of the H1 signal. And we also do a forecasting of the full MIT survey. So the full MIT uh, has, uh, will have uh, data from four well-known fields. So these are the Cosmos, CDFS, XMM, LSS, and ELIAS S1. And it will, it will cover around 20 square degree of uh, sky area and roughly 1,000 hours of observation time. And we forecast that we can achieve uh, around uh, signal to noise ratio of greater than seven at uh, k point four nine, and uh, sure, have, have about two more minutes. Okay, sure. I'll, yes. uh, so, uh, so that's the so this result is published in this paper. So, uh, so this uh, this uh, result looks uh, gives us real um, uh, hope. Optimistic. We are optimistic that with Meerkat we can uh, make a detection of of the H one with uh, with around lots of observation. So that's why we are now targeting for a detection. So we have accurate data of, from the deep two field. So we have already data around hundreds hours of observation of, from this field. So now we have started uh, analyzing the data. 
So as a first phase, we have started with two data blocks of which roughly around uh, 22 hours of observation. And again, we have, to, we have we are doing a simulation and simultaneous simulation and also uh, analyzing the real data. The simulation, we are simulating the H1 and thermal noise from the UV distribution. And the, uh, we have for the foreground component, we have we actually make an image of the deep two field. And it's really, we are imaging a uh, very uh, like high, uh, large area of the, sky, uh, of the field to cover the side lobes. And uh, again, uh, and for the imaging, we, we use uh, with a very large band, so 950 to 1170 megahertz band. And the calibration is done with process meerkat and uh, the cell quails are, is, are done separately. And in this image, we can, we can achieve an RMS about three microgens per day. Uh, so, uh, so the next, uh, uh, I'm going to show uh, the power spectrum results from these two data blocks. So, uh, so each data block has many subscans. So uh, each subscans is around 15 minutes of duration. So to estimate the power spectrum, we actually um, uh, separate out the odd scans and the even scans. And then we cross correlate the two. Uh, it, will, it, it, it removes the noise bias and it also helps to uh, uh, remove many systematics which we are seeing in the previous plots. So on the left side, we, uh, the, the power spectrum from the actual data is shown. And on the right side, the, uh, the results from the simulation. And these are really, uh, they match really well in terms of the foreground isolation and the noise structure here. Uh, and, it, uh, and the many of the systematics were, are really are gone. Uh, and we, we, see, we see few things like some contamination at uh, low K parallel and this uh, at some patches here, which I think are expected at low uh, small baselines because of the crosstalks and uh, table reflection and so on and so forth. So next we are comparing like how the results from the data actually compared with the thermal noise. So uh, we have taken a ratio between the two. So this plot shows out which of the pixels, uh, K pixels are not consistent with the thermal noise. And again, we, these, uh, these are the pixels that we have, we are identified, we have kind of identified that these are not consistent with thermal noise. So the methods we are trying to understand is that if you can uh, mitigate this, some of these effects without losing the sensitivity, and uh, uh, maybe subtract off uh, some of these uh, uh, effects. If not, then we have, may have to uh, flag those K pixels and we'll uh, lose some of the sensitivity. And uh, 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 that's, uh, so that's where we are currently are uh, so in terms of the analysis uh, procedure. So to summarize, uh, intensity mapping is uh, capable of uh, uh, providing many useful cosmological constraints. And interferometric intensity mapping can uh, give a useful complementary to the single dish intensity mapping technique. And uh, one of the uh, major uh, uh, demonstration of this work is that uh, since Meerkat was not designed for this kind of experiments uh, compared to uh, many highly redundant configurations for EOR uh, for, for like HERA or some other experiments. Uh, but still uh, this, uh, with the current configuration, uh, Meerkat can do really well. That's what we have shown. And uh, on the on ongoing projects and the future plans, we are currently working on the uh, on the on the deep two field with around 100 hours of single pointing observation. And in the future, we'll do uh, some cross correlation studies. So some uh, so some galaxy survey, galaxy catalog, and H1 cube cross correlation uh, from the mighty uh, survey project. Some uh, from some well known fields like Cosmos, XMMLSS. And we'll ultimately the final goal is to do intensity mapping with the full mighty survey when the data from all four fields are available. So I'll stop now. Thank you. Thanks, Varun. So uh, time for a few questions. Uh, Rajesh, you can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, thank you for this nice talk. So, so I have a question about the, this mm -hmm. two match about the power spectrum, uh, the mm -hmm. simulated and the observed power spectrum. Uh, not this one. Uh, so the previous match. Yeah. So this okay. one. Okay. Okay. So, so you have a large bandwidth, right? So somewhere around 45 megahertz, right? Uh, 45 megahertz centered at uh, 1 point, uh, some 1.1 gigahertz. Yes, yes. And you are assuming that the signal, so all three directions are same. Means there is no preferred direction, as you have told me. Hmm. But uh, as you know that the frequency direction behave differently than the, the theta direction. I mean, the, the statistics changes along the uh, frequency right. direction. Right. So, so, so that assumption is causing this. Um, uh, that may causing this. Uh, uh, this. Uh, this deviation, right? Uh, which deviation you are talking about? Uh, the leakage here. Your, 
No, yes, the, the, the deviation between the simulated things and the actual observation. Uh, no, no, these are from, these are actual systematics because we have identified a bad antenna and uh, uh, because in the, in the following plot, again, I'm showing a comparison between the uh, data and the simulation. So you see that uh, so, so, many of these so things are gone. your signal is light cone. So your signal is a light cone. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but again, for this, uh, for to estimate a three D power spectrum, you have to assume a uh, assume a finite bandwidth. Otherwise, you have to do a, a angular power spectrum. But since we are doing a three D power spectrum, we actually have to assume some bandwidth, right? No, no. I'm asking the input input signal is a light cone. It's not. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Understand. Okay. So for the input signal, uh, we are just uh, assuming a. Uh, uh, I mean, we are not going overboard with the how, what signal we are putting. So uh, our signal is a, is a is a is a function of k. I mean, uh, I mean, we are not as you, I mean included any redshift space distortion. If that's where uh, uh, you, that's what you are uh, trying to. Uh, yeah. So 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 yeah. the, the the two things the signal in two things are uh, not same. I'm saying that the signal the simulated signal and the observed signal are, are different. I'm saying saying that. Maybe Rajesh, it's a very low redshift, so signal doesn't evolve that much uh, when you consider. No, it evolves for galaxy redshift surveys. Maybe maybe we can take yeah. this up uh, offline yeah, so in, the, in the Slack yeah. or you know during the discussion yeah. session at the end of the uh, talks. Um, so let, let's take a, a Rajesh, if it is okay, I'll go to the next question. Uh, this. Yes, 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 please. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. You look like uh, you're all set for potential detection. Uh, yeah. Looking at the quality of these things. Uh, right. uh, my question is, uh, do I have people, uh, other people or you people looked at polarization as a diagnostics uh, of variety of things that, you know, particularly affect at the lower spatial frequencies, uh, shadowing, reflections, and so on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So we are currently uh, also uh, in the process of doing that. So we we'll, we are actually analyzing all four polarizations, just not just Stokes I. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll come to that because uh, I mean, first is to set the first goal here is to set the noise flow, like what kind of I mean, how low we can go uh, uh, in in terms of the thermal noise, and then yeah, of course we'll come to those uh, issues as well. Due to reduce some of the contamination yes yes so we are we have we have the stokes p power spectrum and we we do see some of these things in the uh, at small uh, key uh, values so those those things do show up in the stokes v um so yeah so right now like uh, as i mentioned like we are currently doing that so trying to uh, 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 mitigate some of these issues yeah all the very best yeah thank you thank you last much. last quick question from kanun uh, so rob uh, mm -hmm. Just I, I just missed uh, your methodology for simulation. So could you uh, explain it a bit more? Uh, okay, so our simulation, see? our simulation is like uh, our actually power the power spectrum pipeline is blind to like what data we are putting. Is it an actual data or is it a simulated data? So we are simulating data like just like the actual data. So we are simulating per baseline. So if we have we have a frequent bandwidth. We have the baseline distribution. So for each baseline, we have an, uh, a contribution from the H1 signal and the thermal noise. And they, then we have, a, we have a sky model. So we can also control, construct the model visibility per baseline. So then we can add all three components per baseline. So, and also, I mean, there is an option to turn on and off any of the components. So, I mean, the pipeline uh, just will just run. So it's just like a simulated visibilities, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Saurabh. Let's uh, move to the next uh, speaker. So maybe you can stop sharing, uh, Madhurima, uh, start your uh, screen share. And I would like to request all the speakers from this session and the previous session to uh, be there for the extended discussion from 4.30 to 5. We are probably running about 10 minutes late, but roughly 4.30 to 5. So uh, everyone, please be there. Uh, so that we can pick up more of this discussion thread. So next speaker is uh, Madhurima from IIT Indore. Madhurima will be talking about parameter estimation and reconstructing thermal and reanalysis histories from 21 centimeter power, power spectrum measurement using neural networks. Madhurima.
Uh, yeah, I got the permission again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, I am uh, Madhurima. I'm a final year PhD student at IIT Indo and I'm working with uh, Abhirup Datta. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, how we can use artificial neural networks to uh, estimate signal parameters, astrophysical parameters from the 21 centimeter power spectrum measurements, and also how we can uh, reconstruct thermal and ionization histories from the 21 centimeter power spectrum measurements. To uh, begin with, um, why 21 centimeter? We all know that very well. One of the most promising uh, way to directly observe both reionization and dark ages would be able to make use of the 21 centimeter hyperfine uh, transition line. So this observable quantity uh, is the differential brightness temperature. By statistically measuring the brightness temperature of the 21 centimeter line, we can uh, probe uh, both the distribution of large scale structures and ionization state of the IGM. So essentially there uh, can be observations using a single dish which can be used uh, to measure the sky average global signal or there could be observations using interferometers to look at the 21 centimeter power spectrum. So experiments targeting uh, observing observation of the power spectrum are MWA, LOFAR, GMR Tihera, SKA. And for global signal, we have edges, Saras, Bighorn, sci High, Lida, Reach, to name a few. So one of the major challenges in the detection of this faint signal are the foregrounds. The foregrounds, which consist of uh, galactic and extragalactic components, they are mostly dominated by synchrotron radiation. These are several orders of magnitude higher than the signal of interest. Then we also have the Earth's ionosphere introducing direction dependent effects. We have RFI. And adding to all of this, uh, the instrument response also changes with observation time and distorts the signal to a great extent. So we have tried to develop an ANN-based framework which can extract the 21 centimeter uh, signal parameters from mock observations using uh, neural networks. So before I continue, I will give a brief overview of how neural, net neural networks work. We usually have a very we should be having a very good data set, which we call the training data set. Now, uh, this data set needs to be split into a training chunk and something kept aside for testing. The training process would involve breaking up this training set data set into several chunks of validation sets uh, in which uh, during the process of uh, training, we keep one of these uh, uh, validation data chunks separate and we train it on the rest of the data and we keep uh, Sure. repeating this process several number of times till we get the best performance. After that, we test uh, our network again with the test data set. So this training process is explained in this following slide. Basically, there are uh, a, a basic neural network consists of input layer and output layer and one or more than one hidden layers. Now, each of the neurons in each of the layers are connected to the next layer uh, with a connection which is associated with a weight and a bias. So um, what exactly happens is as we put in the input through this first input layer and it go goes through all of these connections and we get the output at this output end an error function is usually computed and the aim is that we will minimize or optimize this particular error function or cost function uh, by repeating this process multiple number of times. So this optimization is usually done by backpropagating the errors computed at the end of each of these feed forward uh, processes. So uh, this is how the training process works. And at the end of it, we, uh, if you get a good accuracy, we can say that the model is capable of predicting uh, the targets with so-and-so accuracy. So in the first part of the talk, I will be telling how uh, we have used uh, neural networks to predict the parameters associated uh, associated with the 21 centimeter signal using the mock observations. So in our work, we have used a fast semi-numerical code for reionization called Reionuga. Uh, so in this particular uh, code, uh, we can change the parameters, um, namely the ionizing efficiency, which is alternately called NIN in this framework. In this, um, ionizing efficiency is essentially composed of F star, F escape, and all these quantities. So we have varied this entire combined uh, quantity NIN, 
And we have also varied the minimum halo mass, which is required to, pro to generate different realizations of our, uh, for our net training data set. So the 21 centimeter uh, power, uh, power spectrum is uh, calculated using this. We have the 21 centimeter brightness temperature. We take the Fourier transform and calculate the power spectrum using this above relation. So uh, the flow chart of the framework is as follows. We take the 21 centimeter power spectrum from this semi-numerical code Rhea and Yuga. We add photon power spectrum and this constitutes of our, that entire data set. We then do some uh, pre-processing to the data. We normalize it, uh, throw off the bad data, et cetera. And then we train our network to predict the parameters NIL, MHMIN. RFFP also goes in as a parameter, but since it does not have much value on, uh, much effect on the variation of the power spectrum at all. So we neglect it, we drop it off in the next slide I will show you. Instead, we also try and predict uh, the ionized fraction as a, one of the targets from the data set. So using those parameters, we once again reconstruct the power spectrum. So this is the uh, power spectrum set that we have constructed using the parameters, uh, the ionization, ionizing efficiency, the minimum halo mass, and neutral hydrogen fraction is one, of, one more quantity which we want to predict using our uh, neural network. So for the first, uh, first test, what we do is we don't add any foregrounds. We just add, uh, take this entire data set and we try and predict our uh, parameters, which in our case are these three. In these three plots, you can see that we have plotted the original versus the predicted uh, values of the parameters. Uh, this top left one is for XH1, which is the neutral fraction, which is predicted with very good accuracy. R2 score is the metric which we calculate for each of the parameters separately. Ionization efficiency, uh, the accuracy is around 90%. And for minimum halo mass, it is around 94% when there is no foreground or no noise added. Next, we to the same uh, training data set, we add, uh, we add the noise corresponding to HERA for a thousand, thousand hours of observation. And we see how the prediction has actually changed. The ionizing efficiency uh, drops down, uh, accuracy drops down to around 79%. The neut neutral hydrogen also uh, becomes slightly worse than earlier. Uh, and minimum halo mass remains at 87.87% uh, accuracy. The similar exercise is done with MWA as well as with SKA low, where, when we have not added any kind of foregrounds. So over here, I have just tabulated the accuracies and the plots you can see over here where the original versus the predicted plots are shown. So uh, it performs well uh, when we add no noise corresponding to SKA as well. The, there the ionizing efficiency is around 81 and uh, the neutral fraction is around 93% and minimum, minimum halo, halo mass is around 89%. So what happens when we add the foregrounds? This was all without the foregrounds and it still came out to be around 90% or so, around 90% accuracy. So as soon as we add uh, foregrounds to it, the signal is totally lost as expected and it causes a lot of trouble. Uh, we have used the formulation in Kanandatta et al. Uh, 2006 to convert the CL to PK and then we have added the signal uh, the foreground power spectrum to the 21 centimeter power spectrum, which we have to construct our training set for the four added foregrounds case. So uh, as soon as we, okay. Mm, yeah. As soon as we add the foregrounds, simultaneous prediction of the signal and foreground parameters do not give us very accurate results. Now uh, the network predicts the foreground parameters very, very well, like, uh, as you had seen that uh, we have modeled it as, oh, sorry again. We have modeled it as A to the power, some L to the power uh, minus beta and here alpha. So the parameters of the foregrounds are A, beta and alpha. So these three parameters are predicted with very high accuracy as compared to the signal parameters. So yeah, so this is one example where we have shown how the ionizing efficiency has been predicted. You can see that it has dropped down to around 58%. XH1 is also not at all predicted well. And uh, minimum halo mass also is not that great. 
so then what we do is instead of uh, okay first uh, we using whatever we have got uh, we have uh, reconstructed the power spectrum using using the parameters which were predicted by the neural network in the added foreground case so the plots over here shows the original and the reconstructed signal from the results which we have got so next what we do is uh, we uh, first we split it up into two parts we uh, give the input data set which consists of the power spectrum and the foreground then we do the bit of pre processing and we put it into the anl and we try and extract the power spectrum from this entire uh, uh, data set from the power spectrum then we can use it to estimate the associated parameters just like the no no foreground split uh, no foreground added case so what we do is in the test test set now we uh, we add, we make it in such a way that we put the input power spectrum we add noise corresponding to ska for 1000 hours of observation and we add the foreground power spectrum to it and uh, this is what we get so uh, from the entire from the four, total observation we can see that we could recover the power spectrums quite well when we uh try to recover the power spectrum as a whole instead of looking for the parameters explicitly now this particular output is fed into the neural network again to predict the parameters associated with this power spectrum so here the network accuracy is quite good and from uh, this predicted power spectrum we can easily uh, find out the signal parameters just like the no foreground case with very good accuracy around 90% so uh, this was the first part of the work where uh, we have uh, used uh, we have added foregrounds and uh, done this in the next part of the talk i will be telling you how we can extract thermal and ionization history from 21 cm uh, power spectrum data using neural networks so over here our tra training data set is uh, just the power spectrum information for uh, a particular k range which is between 0.03 to 1.09 mega per second inverse and uh, z information is there for around z is equal to 5 to 45 so each of the input data set over here consists of power spectrum uh, for each of these red shifts and k values so that total data set is what i am calling the 21 cm power spectrum information in total from that we have used a neural network to predict the thermal history the ionization history and the lyman alpha histories corresponding to each of these realization so uh, we follow a similar framework we put the input data set into our neural network and we uh, predict the corresponding thermal ionization and the lyman alpha histories for each and every model so uh, these are the results in the first plot you can see that we have when we uh, when we give the entire data set as input these are the recovered thermal histories now the predicted thermal histories for using the neural network and on the right hand side panel you can see the ionization histories which have been predicted with pretty good accuracy so this framework would be extremely useful to uh, extract uh, ionization histories and thermal histories from power spectrum information in at some later stages but you may you have about two more minutes yeah so over here in this plot for the another uh, approach what we have done is we have split that entire information into uh, separate z bins and we have uh, used okay the drawback there was we were uh, predicting the Uh, these quantities separately using uh, different neural networks for each of these targets so uh, essentially our aim is that we can give given the data and get all this information at once so uh, what we do is uh, over here we split up the information into uh, some redshift bins and then we make separate neural networks to predict these quantities uh, predict the quantities of neutral fraction and the thermal history uh, from those Uh, using those networks so here i have shown just one of the examples like per, we have split it up into several uh, redshift bins and over here we have just shown for 9.25 here you can see that the r2 score is around 80% this is around 78% for the thermal history so and for another analysis what we have done for a part, if we look at separate k modes specifically we can uh, reconstruct the thermal histories and the 
ionization histories and Lyman alpha histories again separately uh, using the neural network framework. So you can see uh, the dotted plots are all the predictions and the solid lines are the original plots. So over here you can see how we have uh, uh, reconstructed the neutral fraction and Lyman alpha histories at k is equal to 0.1. So uh, similar work has been done for other k bins as well. So we will be combining all of that into one single framework to use to predict the ionization histories, Lyman alpha histories, and the therm uh, thermal histories from a total power spectrum information. So as a summary, we have used a uh, framework based on neural networks and predicted astrophysical parameters as well as physical quantities associated with the 21 centimeter signal. We have extracted the associated parameters in the presence of thermal noise uh, as per HERA, MWA, and SK using a modified version of 21 centimeter sense. Also for the first time, we have shown that 21 centimeter power spectrum can be extracted from mock observations without fitting for the foregrounds and other systematics explicitly. So this is a very computationally efficient technique and utilizes a realistic training data set. So uh, it might complement other techniques of parameter estimation and signal extraction in future. And yeah, it can be used to extract many other relevant quantities other than what has direct functional relationships with the input data as well. So thank you. If you have any questions, please. Thanks. Thanks, Madhurima. Uh, so I see already two hands. Kanan, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Madhurima. Hi. Uh, hi yeah. Good work. Uh, I just wanted to know um, uh, when you uh, when you try to extract uh, reionization model parameters like ionizing efficiency, hmm. uh, the first part of your talk. Uh, yes. So how, how do you train your data? You have power spectrum, right? Uh, you see, you, you train power spectrum. Yes. And so, then uh, output, uh, you have you compare uh, the model parameters, uh, yeah. predicted and then uh, targeted. Yeah, so basically, uh, in this first part, I have shown again two sub parts, in one in which there was no foregrounds added. So here, yeah. there were no foregrounds added, we are just inputting the power spectrum as the input data. And uh, because it and we are trying to predict uh, this ionizing efficiency and minimum halo mass, these are the targets and the neutral fraction. So when we are training, right. what we are doing is because it's a supervised learning method, we, uh, we are giving this as the input and we are telling the network that these are the associated parameters to the inputs. So you should find if some unknown power spectrum is given to you, you should be able to predict the ionizing efficiency, minimum halo mass and neutral hydrogen fraction for that particular power spectrum. Right. Yeah. So here, uh, uh, I, I know just a size and instead of comparing the whole, instead of uh, using the entire power spectrum, you can just focus on maybe lar large scale power spectrum, the small k uh, basically, because the, the change in the power spectrum is uh, probably is uh, more at the low k. Yeah. Yes, yes. So maybe the power uh, model parameter has more impact on those side of the power spectrum uh, in compared to the uh, 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 large scale. So yes, can... yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. We've we've actually done that when we were uh, looking at the like when we add the noise corresponding to Hera MWASK. We right. are looking at much smaller uh, K ranges as well. So that at that time the training is being done only at that particular K range. Right. So, and you, you see some uh, better results or uh, still the same? No, with foregrounds, it is just uh, quite bad. Without foregrounds, it is around like it's around 90, 80 to 90 percent for each of the th mm. each of the cases. Okay. When we add the noise. Yeah, I saw the foreground things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Tate. Yeah, Mandurima. Uh, so, uh, I was wondering if you have checked. Uh, whether your results, the recoveries of these parameters mm -hmm. depend on the box size and the resolution of your simulations. In other words, have the results converged numerically? No, this I have not checked. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can because 
with the excursion set models, there has always been a concern whether the results converge with respect to the resolution of the box. Okay, I'll look at it. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe a final quick question from this. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, does, does this uh, approach give you indications of correlated errors or degenerate solutions uh, uh, and the uncertainties associated with it, uh, which are coupled? Yes, see, uh, basically, uh, that, that is what we need to do at the pre processing uh, stage. So we, uh, we look at the associations with each of the parameters within themselves and see that there is any kind of degeneracy, which, if possible, we can remove it. Or, or we can let the network only uh, learn and find out how well they can uh, predict those particular parameters. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Madhurima. I don't see any other uh, question. We can continue the discussion in Slack. Uh, so uh, let's move to the uh, next talk, the last talk of the session. Um, so if you stop sharing, Aishila Majumdar, who is the next speaker, um, Aishila, you should be able to um, share and also Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, hi everyone. I'm Ashrila from IIT Indore, and uh, today we you, will. Uh, your sorry, your slides are not yet visible. It's says loading. Uh, yeah. Now, now it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so today I'll be presenting our work on the effect of calibration and position errors on the recovery of the cosmological minimum centimeter signal using sensitive interferometers. And we, this work I've done in collaboration with the OP group and ONMO. And so uh, just for completeness, I will uh, go through the, this uh, very briefly that as we all know that uh, during the evolution history of the universe, the period during which uh, the uh, first structures begin to appear is known as uh, the cosmic dawn. And uh, when uh, ionizing emissions are emitted from those structures, the IGM, which was uh, completely neutral at the, uh, that time, begins to get ionized, and that uh, uh, results in uh, the uh, phase transition, which is known as the epoch of reionization. Now, uh, currently, there are quite a number of experiments that are trying to de detect the, this signal from these uh, very early uh, epochs of uh, the uh, history of universe in order to uh, constrain various parameters and the uh, astrophysics that was at play during those periods. Now, the problem with such detections is that because the signals uh, are extremely, extremely weak, so there are a lot of factors that uh, comes in uh, real observations and effectively uh, uh, makes the signal totally undetectable. Now, one of those uh, factors is, uh, as has been discussed uh, uh, today, is the astrophysical foreground. Now, uh, there is also the instrument itself, which can introduce uh, spurious structures and other, uh, uh, and other uh, effects that can confuse the detection of the signal. And then the Earth ionosphere is also there, which uh, pred produces direction-dependent effects that can once again cause uh, problems in signal de uh, detection. And uh, since all observations are limited by the sensitivity of the instrument, so that is something we have to respect in order to uh, give realistic uh, predictions of how much signal can uh, one particular instrument actually detect. And then there is this uh, hindrance of RFI, which uh, when we remove from the uh, and observe data, the flagging causes the introduction of a lot of Fourier structures, as you heard in Ornob's talk today. Now, thing is that individually, each of these aspects, like foreground, instrumental effect, ionosphere, all these individually have been very well studied. But the thing is that once we are trying to go into uh, observations with telescopes like SKA, the data volumes are going to be huge. And unless we have uh, beforehand a very good idea of how is it that uh, 
a combination of with these errors can affect our signal there is a pretty much a lot of trouble we'll have to go through to actually recover the signal so with that uh, motivation we had started to make uh, a piece wise observational pipeline so that we can incorporate realistic effects that go into any observation and see how much uh, the, how badly they will affect uh, the uh, detection of the signal uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, as we know if, uh, if, uh, there are uh, the radio interferometer measures the fourier transform of the sky and uh, the very uh, simplistically speaking this uh, the observed signal that we have here is the uh, uh, is the gi and gj uh, the complex instrument the games as uh, with the uh, with the gij true which is the true sky visibility now uh, the thing is that the when we uh, take any radio astronomical data the first thing that comes to our mind is to calibrate for the gains where we solve for the g's and ideally if we will lived in a perfect world this uh, g should uh, solve and come out to be 1 and hence we will get uh, v of the is equal to the true visibility that uh, it is there in the sky but because any algorithm that we use for calibration will come with its own uh, set of uh, limitations so we have to uh, need a uh, we need to quantify the tolerance of those accuracies like how much accuracy can a particular instrument actually tolerate before, before there is a the, before there is the these uh, gain errors start seeping into the act, uh, seeping into our actual detection and start causing problems and uh, as uh, we i have already mentioned there is the problem of foreground there are way too many too bright foregrounds that we have to deal with and while synchrotron remains the dominant source for uh, any uh, experiment that is uh, conducted at low frequencies like those we are target frequencies which we do for eor it has been previously shown that unmodeled point source when they are present in the data they can also uh, uh, cause problems in uh, actual uh, signal uh, detection uh, in uh, statistical uh, sense so with this uh, view in mind we have uh, made uh, an observational pipeline the idea is to that in steps we uh, we need to incorporate all the effects that can actually uh, cause the uh, signal to Uh, to get uh, obscured and initially we have uh, started with an input parameter which is a very uh, simplistic uh, foreground model consisting of uh, uh, that we have derived uh, from a real catalog of the elias northman field and a um, uh, 21 cm uh, signal that ca can be generated either by 21 cm fast or some ria nuva it doesn't matter but we actually need a 21 cm uh, signal and a foreground model now what we have done is using this combination of uh, inputs if we uh, observe it with some kind of a telescope configuration then as you can see in this panel this is the kind of sky that we will observe so the uh, obviously as expected it is dominated by the points of foregrounds that we have uh, put in now uh, after uh, this uh, initial uh, observation step we are uh, uh, we can uh, incorporate calibration errors into the observed visibility or uh, uh, make an erroneous sky model and re observe and subtract uh, the visibilities that we think are the true sky visibilities from them to determine how the uh, how they, uh, that will affect the uh, signal and uh, as we here with this uh, the vij corrected is the uh, Uh, uh is the, the visibility that we have actually uh, corrupted with some kind of uh, uh, corruptions and the residual visibilities are the one that we uh, that we have obtained after subtracting the corrupted visibilities from the actual uh, sky model that we are supposing is free from any error and now in this slide uh, for this particular work we have uh, used the four telescope layouts one is the sk1 uh, low layout now this is obviously not exactly like the sk layout that they have uh, given in the documentation and that is because actual sk consists of baselines as uh, long as 65 kilometers and for the particular case of eor science we don't really need those long uh, baselines so we have uh, taken up 
all uh, the stations around the central station that are within two kilometers. And uh, we have uh, come with uh, this kind of a layout. And this is the 350 tile layout for Hera. And uh, these two bottom panels are for MWA1, that is the MWA configuration before they had upgraded to the 256 tile configuration. And MWA2 is the uh, current 256 tile configuration that is being used. And uh, the parameters that we have taken is that we have taken an observation of uh, at uh, centered at 142 megahertz and uh, taken a bandwidth of 8 megahertz around it with 64 frequency channels uh, with a field of view of about uh, 4 degrees. And uh, uh, the uh, and uh, the synthesized beam, as we can see in Arc Minute, are uh, of these values for the different instrument, obviously, because then they do not have identical baselines. So the synthesized beam sizes have varied. And since Hera has the shortest baselines of all the uh, four configurations that we have picked out, it has a very wide kind of a synthesized beam. And uh, these are the theoretical thermal noise uh, limits given the uh, given this. Uh, uh, number of uh, you know, frequency channels, this uh, bandwidth, this uh, number of instruments, and, and uh, the observation time that we have used. And uh, so the, the first what we have done is, as a metric to quantify image plane performance, we have taken the residual data with the, for uh, calibration error. Here we can see the results for calibration error. Determined a dirty image for those, and just uh, found out the RMS of the, that image, and uh, what we have found was that for the calibration errors of up to point, uh, uh, 10 to the power minus 2 percent, uh, SK the, uh, the has uh, the, the uh, RMS in its image that is well below this signal level that we have actually de uh, detected if uh, for a sky that has only uh, signal and uh, no uh, and uh, like uh, nothing else. And uh, similarly, this uh, gray region is the, the, the is the, uh, the signal amplitudes that we have detected for uh, various configurations. And as we can see, this band is the region within which our signal uh, observed signals have been confined. And beyond the uh, 0.01 percent, the the RMS starts to go above our signal level, and uh, uh, the image plane performance of, for these telescopes become very bad. But in the case of the other configurations, what we have found was that 0 0.01 is actually a borderline kind of a case. Uh, there, if maybe with even more careful analysis, we probably, uh, the performance may be better. But uh, for SK, it's uh, very, it's uh, uh, better uh, anyway. But the, as it turns out, this 0.01% is the limit beyond uh, which Whatever uh, the configuration we are using, the image plane RMS uh, for the dirty cube uh, goes uh, uh, way above the signal level. And, uh, and so that is kind of the image plane calibration uh, error tolerance limit that we have put for uh, all the four configurations that we have currently used. Actually, you have about three more minutes. And uh, for the uh, yeah, and for the uh, position errors also, we have found that uh, for a position error of 0.1% uh, uh, or 0.1%, uh, uh, the uh, uh, RMS goes beyond the, uh, the signal level, and uh, there is a little chance of uh, the detecting the uh, being the, uh, the image plane performance being better. And so then what we have uh, done is, try to uh, determine the path spectrum for this residual image. And as uh, Ornob already said in his talk that we have used this uh, delay domain formalism where we have initially uh, made the delay transform of the visibilities and determine the two dimensional path spectrum with proper normalization uh, after which we have actually uh, used uh, uh, the spherical binning to determine the uh, 2D, uh, the 3D path spectrum. and. Uh, uh, one the thing is that since we do not know what kind of country, uh, arrangement SK is actually using, so we just went for the, to, uh, ahead and took up all the KMOs that were accessible to us to do this analysis. And as uh, we can see in uh, case of uh, in a 3D path spectrum also, in uh, for the errors as uh, low as 0.01%, uh, it's uh, the power of the actual signal power goes below the residual power and beyond these values, there is a huge deviation between the residual power and the signal power, which implies that the signal is uh, getting uh, obscured uh, by, by these uh, residuals. 
and uh, similarly in the case of uh, position errors also we have found that uh, um, position errors as uh, low as uh, point the one percent with respect to the uh, uh, actual position uh, is uh, tolerable but beyond that the there the deviation starts and if we give any more er erroneous position than this the power or uh, the residual power goes uh, much beyond the actual signal power and uh, the uh, one thing i should point out is that i have shown these results here for the configuration of uh, sk that i have previously mentioned but we didn't find too much deviation from this particular trend in case of uh, the other three configurations that we have used and so what we can then say is that the two of the percentages namely 0.01% uh, in case of calibration error and the at most 0.1% for position error is a tolerable error limit uh, given that everything else is uh, good uh, which will can actually lead to the signal power being extracted or the image plane detection of the signal being done and what we have found is that we have checked with other sky model as well as other uh, signal models and we have found the performance to be consistent which again shows that the pipeline itself is not suffering from any kind of input say bias or anything so uh, but then again i have to uh, also mention but that this is the most simplest uh, analysis that we have done since we are proceeding step by step we have done it with just some foreground uh, signal and a little bit of contamination but the main uh, the thing is the diffuse foreground which we now have to add to the uh, to the pipeline and see how the performance goes and how much tolerance for in presence of those errors is there in our signal and also we this, these uh, simulations are completely noise free we have to go for realistic thermal noise cases and some uh, rsi work that has been already done by orno but we have to incorporate it in the pipeline to see the overall combined effect and obviously if, uh, if possible we should also incorporate the ionospheric effects and beam effects so that at the end of the day we have a complete pipeline that can give us a realistic estimate of what kind of things we can ex expect from upcoming arrays like sk and hera thank you Thanks, Ashula. So, are there questions? Please raise your hand. Yes, this you should be able to unmute and. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, shouldn't many of these uh, estimates of percentage tolerance uh, be possible from simply asking the question of this is the uncertainty in the image uh, at a given pixel and what all that can come from. Uh, it can come from position error, uh, you know, uh, calibration error and so on. Have you tried to relate that backwards to see at the first level, all these expectations match uh, with this nice consideration? Uh, so, uh, this, can you repeat your question? I didn't get it. Yeah, the question is simple that uh, finally, uh, you know, all the quality of it, depends on the accuracy to which you can measure intensity in every pixel of the image, correct? Yeah, yeah. So that at a level, you know, when you're on a point source, uh, you know, the calibration errors can make uh, the po position errors and other calibration errors uh, will let, will change the intensity that you see in practice compared to what you should yeah. have seen. That difference is the one that is going to finally affect your final result. You can ask how much of deviation in the position is required to create that difference in the intensity uh, at a given pixel and see if your estimates that you have presented are consistent with this naive uh, relation that you can infer uh, directly without doing much calculations. Number two, many of the percentages you mentioned are, can be misleading because they are related to different telescopes, different systems. They have different resolutions. Uh, so for all you know, the level to which the results are affected uh, is by a common number in terms of accuracy of uh, position and so on. And that might be common. It might appear like different percentage of uh, something for a given telescope. 
uh, yeah desh if i may something you know i think you are talking about the position error mainly right because that i'm just giving uh, you as an example uh, Uh, yes desh for the position error i actually haven't shown the graph here but we have uh, also done it for the absolute values like as you already mentioned the uh, uh, actual values for say 10% for one telescope uh, the position displacement might not be the same for the other one so what we had also done is that that 10% value will correspond to some actual deviation in uh, arc second or something so we had also plotted those values and found those to be consistent with what we are getting in percentages i actually haven't shown the graph here but that we have already done yeah but do they come out to be similar in respect to the telescope that's the question uh yeah we actually didn't find too much difference uh, between them correct so the, the level to which these things are affected is by the particular angular shifts rather than the percentage of their okay so thank you thank you for clarifying that that answers my question yeah yeah thanks question yeah i mean uh, it was a similar question just i wanted to ask how much does the uh, baseline completeness affect the result baseline completeness means that how much of the uh, baseline plane is of uh, covered with the observed visibilities how does that oh. affect the result okay that we haven't systematically checked but what we had done is that for the amount of uh, baseline the coverage that we took and the time of observation that we took we saw the uv coverage and it is actually very good considering that we had actually timed our observation in such a way that the source is uh, mostly uh, at, at most uh, plus minus 2 uh, hour angle so we got a very nice uv coverage and so we have proceeded with that what you are saying is that for that we have to do another systematic study and that hasn't been done yet okay okay as i don't see any other uh, raised hand uh, i guess there is no more question right now so uh, thank you as well and with that we come to the end of uh, this session uh, with the three talks